Hello, and welcome to this, our 11th podcast, coming to you live from COP26. I'm Casey Schulberg, Collier County Waterkeeper, your host for tonight's show, along with Dr. John Capice, the Kissimmee Waterkeeper, and Chris Wilkie, Global Advocacy Manager for the Waterkeeper Alliance. Today at the conference was Transportation Day, and as cars and trucks are huge carbon emitters, much of the focus was on transitioning to electric cars called Zero Emission Vehicles, or ZEVs. You didn't know you would all be driving ZEVs, did you? There's even a ZEV Transition Council for which the acronym is ZEVTC. There was a big deal made by the president of COP26 about a proclamation signed by 30 nations that agreed to make ZEVs accessible, affordable, and sustainable in all regions by 2030 or 2035. The World Bank is creating a new, a new trust fund that will mobilize $200 million over the next 10 years to decarbonize road transport in emerging markets and developing economies. Doesn't seem like an astronomical sum. Uh, 19 governments have also stated, stated their intent to support the establishment of green shipping corridors, zero emission shipping routes between two ports. This will involve deploying zero emission vessels uh, and technologies that put alternative fuel and charging infrastructure in place in ports to allow for zero emission shipping on key routes, key routes across the globe. That sounds pretty cool. The UK has pledged to shift to clean trucks by committing to end the sale of most new diesel trucks between 230, 2035 and 2040. So this much touted declaration was signed by Austria, Azerbaijan, Cambodia, Canada, Cape Verde, Cape, Cape Verde, Chile, Croatia, Cyprus, Denmark, El Salvador, Finland, Iceland, Ireland, Israel, Lithuania, Luxembourg, Netherlands, New Zealand, Norway, Poland, Slovenia, Sweden, United Kingdom, and Uruguay. Notice any uh, notable nations that are not on the list? I wonder how you say blah, blah, blah in Cape Verdean. Is it only me or, do, or are we not addressing these issues with sufficient urgency? Nancy Pelosi was here, still is here, so was AOC. In fact, one of our team members, Rock Abujwade, buttonholed AOC and got five seconds with her. She invited him to interview her tomorrow, but then got whisked away by her security detail before a rendezvous could be set up. So we're hoping to catch up with her tomorrow. Uh, Rock is a pretty determined young man, so he may, he may just get it done. Uh, speaking of legislators, we do encourage water capers to work on policy with elected officials. As Obama said two days ago, you have to work in the system while also pushing and mobilizing from the outside. So we want to highlight one such working relationship. Ivy Franjoka is the Casco Baykeeper in Maine, and she has a good working relationship with Maine State House Representative from District 3, Lydia Bloom, who is a member of the bipartisan National Environmental Legislators Caucus, and who is here at the COP. At the COP. I caught up with both of them today, uh, Ivy back in Maine and Julia here at the conference. Can roll the tape. Well, we are really pleased to have two, uh, two folks with us today. Ivy Frignoca is the Costco Baykeeper. And we, we also, since we're focusing a little bit on the, uh, the uh, joint work between uh, waterkeepers and policymakers, we've invited Lydia Bloom. Lydia Bloom is a state representative from Maine for district, House District 5, and that's in the hey. town uh, 3, pardon me, House District 3. And uh, so Lydia is on the ground at COP, so we, we're, we've asked her to join us for this, uh, for this little dialogue, and she's doing great work, so we'll hear about that in a second. So Ivy, uh, tell us what your top line concerns are re related to uh, COP26, what you want to see out of this COP26, and how you and Lydia are working together to drive change. Sure, Lydia and I have been working together to drive change for a number of years now. And um, what, what we really want to see is action, not, not words. We want to know action and commitments, firm commitments to act. And being a water keeper, we're very focused on acting in our watershed and looking for solutions to problems at our level and knowing that that um, is part of like a bigger whole, a bigger solution. So that is really um, that is really our focus because we know that the climate 
emergency that we're facing can't be solved by us alone, particularly in Maine, where our entire population is 1.3 million people. So what are the what are the greatest challenges you face uh, for for climate change in your watershed, Ivy? So some of the biggest challenges we face are um, obviously a big thing that needs to happen is we need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere and Maine can't do that alone. So we need to do that as part of regional collaboratives and through working on national and international solutions. And that's why we're so glad to be part of the Waterkeeper Alliance and tie into those kind of networks. So that's a really big challenge is Maine can't solve a reduction of greenhouse gas emissions alone. A lot of what we receive comes from out of state. The second is the solutions that we're looking for rely on projections of future conditions because we know everything is changing and changing quickly. So we can't just rely on data from the past. We have to figure out how the Bay might look into the future and then help it be resilient. So we're studying very much the effects of ocean acidification. We're looking at sea level rise projections, increased storm surge, trying to figure out um, what our bay may be facing and how we can help it adapt. And that is where the focus of our solutions is. And that is how Lydia's work and my work have been part of a voluntary statewide network that's looking at um, ocean acidification and draws together government and private um, groups that are working on the science and policy recommendations. And Lydia and I also serve together on Maine Climate Council. She actually sits on the Climate Council that uh, developed the Maine Won't Wait Climate Action Plan. And I uh, played a big role on the Coastal and Marine Working Group of that plan and have since started an ocean climate collaborative to carry out some of the recommendations of the Coastal and Marine Working Group. That sounds great. Um, so Lydia, you're you're here. You've been here since uh, uh, Sunday, I think, and uh, and now you're leaving on Thursday. Uh, what you you were on a panel today? So tell us about that panel. Really eager to hear how you and Ivy work together uh, as you know, on a collaborative basis, sort of a policy waterkeeper, uh, you know, collective to uh, to see what you know what can be done for for Maine and your your uh, constituency. Working with scientists in Maine, including um, Ivy, it, has, it, it, it really has revealed how important and how deep our scientific community is in Maine. Uh, it's very impressive. And, and we were able to so quickly put together that Maine Climate Council report when you think about it. Well, they, the, the scientists produced a 375 page report, their science and technical report. Um, and, and, and all the working groups took that information in making their recommendations. Uh, and so I find, first of all, that, that, that is a, that, that's a wonderful thing to have is to be able to work with these scientists and represent them uh, in policy. And, you know, science informing policy is extremely important and I feel like I'm not the scientist, but I appreciate the science and respect it and want to see it in the policy. So that's really how we work together. Uh, uh, that's what I've tried to do. And I just wanna also say another thing that I'm seeing here is the emphasis on nature-based solutions. It is extremely encouraging to see that that's, that's, that's the emphasis, it's not on hard, hard scraping and things like that. It's about using natural solutions. And that's encouraging because that's something that we're gonna find much easier to do in Maine because we have such a natural backdrop uh, to, to everywhere in the state and less people as pointed out by Ivy. So uh, I, I'm encouraged by that. I'm encouraged that there's going to be a lot of collaboration with other areas uh, as to what the best solutions are. Uh, and I also see, you know, that this is that this, organizations like the organizations I'm involved with here, the National Caucus of Environmental Legislators, is also a bipartisan caucus. 
that we can exchange ideas already we're exchanging ideas. I had a panel today that was about um, uh, really local and regional collaborations on carbon reduction. And the one that we have that's been involved since 2009 is Reggie, the Regional Greenhouse Gas, and Gas Initiative. That, you know, with my colleague, I had a colleague from uh, New Hampshire, I mean, uh, Rhode Island and Massachusetts. And there's fairly mixed reviews uh, about it in the sense that it hasn't really helped reduce um, fracking, for example, and getting energy from that from gas. So we need to we need to reinvent. We need to maybe look at it and bring it up to speed a little bit more. And adding things like social value to the price of carbon. So you 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 have a number that raises the price instead of it's right now it's kind of pushed down and it's it's good for Maine in the sense that for every dollar we invest in Reggie we get two dollars back and it apparently pays for about a seventh of all efficiency Maine's good work which is a wonderful organization in Maine that helps with weatherization and other and upgrades to consumers so we're getting a we're getting a, a greenhouse gas benefit from it in terms of what we do with the money in Maine, uh, but in terms of carbon pricing, not so good. So that and again, this collaboration and learning and from other states and what Washington State is doing right now, uh, how they've really taken a carbon pricing scheme, and it is everybody in Washington state, every business is no one's exempt, where Reggie is just for power plants, for example. So again, I, I think that the states are leading, the states, the more we do as the states, everyone's come up to me as well. It says, oh, Maine passed the, uh, the, the extended producer responsibility bill for first in the nation. This is the kind of, this is what we need to do as states, is, is, is influence each other and, 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 and hopefully, ultimately, influence the federal government to help us. Um, you know, we're on a good trajectory in Maine. We, we, we've taken something and turned it around very quickly in the last two, three years. It's, well, it's been real yeah. incredible. I, I really applaud that. That sounds great. And the way you and Ivy are working together could be a model for other, uh, other you know, watersheds, other water keepers around the world to, because policy is so important. You know, we're, we're scientists, we're largely scientists. We, you know, we work to get information out about what's going on in our watersheds, but we can't forget the policy angle of it. It's part of what Obama was saying yesterday, how important it is to work through the system as well as working out of the system. I love what Greta is saying, and I love the urgency she's calling for and the, the demand to shape up, uh, to, to jolt the, uh, the delegates into some kind of action. I think that's really, really necessary. But what you guys are doing is really methodical and consistent and, and, and impact, impactful. So- um, Yeah, Casey, um, just to drive that point home, I think what Greta was saying and the youth of today are, like, there's no excuse. We need to act no matter what. So even before um, Maine was in a position where we had government leadership, we stepped in, out, people outside of government stepped in and created this voluntary network to carry forward the research and make policy recommendations. And that set a foundation for the Climate Council when Maine was ready to pass a bill and begin this climate work. So. The message that that we would leave are you can do this even if you have no money and no mandate that MOCA collaborative that we set up has gained national attention as a way to to not make an excuse there's a problem we need to act on it and just find a way to do it and just do it and that's where go Greta and go everyone else who's pushing us to do that yeah, I mean, uh, the, the prospect is a little grim at the moment, I got to say, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't fight and fight harder. We have to actually push harder than we're currently pushing. Uh, in, despite, despite the gloom and doom that we might be facing, we have to just push through and uh, get some of this going. Um, that sounds good. Do you have any more panels that you're going to conduct or sit on, uh, Lydia, this week? 
Uh, no, I, I, I'm, I'm done with that for, for now, uh, but I'm, I'm attending as many as I can uh, and, and learning, le learning how to, to navigate all this because they're trying to also, not, nothing's on paper. So you really have to find it either on the on the, on the internet or walk around and see what the cover, what, what what time things are happening. Uh, but it's a very interesting um, gathering. I'm certainly learning a lot. And uh, again, those overarching themes that I mentioned earlier of the urgency and the youthful involvement and the youth and youth being told that yes, we are listening. I, I just think that that's going to be so that's a helpful thing. And so the next thing I want to do is, is I really want to focus more on climate communication, understanding how best we can involve more people. Uh, and I think it has a lot to do with, with using the right words, like social value uh, and, and environmental justice brings very true to a lot of uh, a lot of people as well. And that's been another push here, by the way. Environmental yeah. justice, yeah, we, just trend. Yeah, we found some inadequacies just in the organization of the COP. Uh, there's no central board to go and see what the programs are in or all, all of the place. It's maddening to try to figure out what's going on. Where there's seven different programs, streams of programs, and there's no one place to go and see what's 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 going on on a given day that's infuriating i also think they miss an advantage to allow more exchange between the students and the delegates it's really a, a sort of a inside the citadel and outside the citadel and i think that's just wrong i wish there were some way they don't none of them have badges but they wish they were they would go outside and just have a discussion with these kids or an online discussion so i I think those are sort of failings of the cop uh, and, and we'll see whether anything meaningful sure. comes out of it we've made some progress but whether anything meaningful comes out of the the, the, the conference i think we still remains to be seen yeah, yeah lydia like, that's a really good point i think we should bring that home like making sure that here we're listening to those voices that are outside of the room you know we're privileged to have seats at the table in the climate conversations but mm -hmm. um I know we've made efforts, but maybe we need to double back and make even more efforts to make sure we're listening and involving youth. Very true. Other voices. It's, it's, for, it's for our mental health. I mean, it's for their mental health. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Ivy. How, how are the lobsters doing? Are they affected by sea level, by temperature rise? What's that industry like? Yes. There? So the lobsters continue to shift further north and further um, out to sea because the temperatures are warming. Uh, there are times when it's much warmer and they're molting earlier. So the, you know, that hard shell season, um, which is a more lucrative for our, our lobstermen, um, that is changing. And as the waters warm, we expect that there will be more shell disease in the lobsters, um, the prevalence of that. The other um, impact that we're seeing is that as the waters warm, it's having an effect on the um, copepods that feed the juvenile lobsters and so there there are uh, it, it's stressful even for the lobsters at their very young stages what took before for them to mature is uh, is changing mm -hmm. yeah I mean we're seeing even incremental changes in southwest Florida where we are even incremental changes have a monumental impact on our yes. on our here uh so and we're looking at you know if we if, if i think it's going to be hard to hold to 1.5 which is 2.7 degrees fahrenheit and if we go above that it could be three degrees fahrenheit and that's a huge huge change and it'll bring all kinds of you know it'll, it'll create tectonic shifts in our in our weather patterns and in our uh, droughts and fires and whatnot so uh we're all in this uh we're fighting we're we're you know we're fully aware of the challenges, uh, but we're undeterred in our, uh, in our uh, passion to, uh, to apply ourselves and really, really pleased with all the water keepers we've met this week and uh, their commitment to these issues. And thank you, Lydia, for your work in this domain. And Ivy, keep going. It sounds like you're doing a great job. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, thank Casey. You. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. On we go, folks. Have a great week, Lydia, before you go home. We'll Thanks, talk Lydia, to you for joining us. We'll talk we'll to see you soon, Ivy. Back. See you, Ivy. Okay, bye, Lydia. Thank you so bye. much.
So there you have another example of a smart, dedicated water keeper, Ivy Franjoka, the Costco Baykeeper in Maine. And it's nice to see Julia taking a lead on carbon pricing and some other issues. Uh, so uh, Chris, you had an important day yesterday. Uh, Chris and his team, uh, their coalition, actually delivered a declaration to the Secretariat of the United Nations Conference. That is a big deal. Uh, so here's a short tape. Uh, filmed by a video videographer working with them, Haley Stewart, with interviews of Chris's partners in that effort. And then we'll come back and we'll talk to Chris about yesterday's events. So we'll, we'll let's look at the tape now. Hi, Casey, John, everyone. Uh, we're here in the action zone of the COP26. This is uh, zone B. This is a place where a lot of conversations happen. And earlier today, our Rivers for Climate Coalition delivered a declaration to the United Nations uh, asking them to declare hydropower energy is not a form of green energy and not worthy of getting any sort of credits or incentives uh, for climate change mitigation. And we presented that with uh, a group of advocates and indigenous leaders directly to the UN. We gave them a physical copy of the declaration and we also are gonna be transmitting it online. Um, and so we're gonna hear from a few of those uh, activists in just a second, uh, but just more about the hydropower issue. It, we've been talking about it all week. It is not a form of green energy. Uh, behind these dams, you have decomposition is occurring in the water. And it's emitting methane, and that is a very potent greenhouse gas, uh, 86 times more uh, potent than carbon dioxide. Uh, so this is a false solution. Uh, but beyond that, we also know that it destroys climate resilience and just destroys rivers. Uh, and we can't uh, ask our rivers to bear any more pollution or our river communities. Uh, so now we're going to hear from um, a couple of our activists that are here with us today. My name is Fernanda. Soy del pueblo originario Mapuche en Chile. Eh, soy de una comunidad donde tenemos tres centrales hidroeléctricas. Eh, no queremos que se sigan construyendo hidroeléctricas en nuestro territorio, por lo tanto también estamos como pueblo apoyando a esta petición. Queremos que la ONU deje de reconocer las represas como energías limpias. En nuestro territorio han generado eh, mucho daño, han inundado cementerios ancestrales. Nuestro territorio está declarado por el gobierno chileno como zona de sacrificio. No queremos más hidroeléctricas en nuestros territorios, queremos vivir como un pueblo libre, queremos vida, queremos nuestro ecosistema y nuestra biodiversidad libre. Hi, my name is Kieran Labar. I'm Métis Indigenous from Manitoba, Canada, and I'm with Ponisicatan, which represents northern indigenous communities who are impacted by hydro development. As many people have said here today, there's numerous impacts on both the climate and indigenous communities. Um, we're here to just bring awareness to that and have a conversation with indigenous communities and the people who are putting them in place. There's no communication that's happening. It's being done without any rights or anything like that. In British Columbia right now, Site C is being developed on the Peace River, and if that goes through, 128 kilometers of indigenous um, sacred land and territory will be flooded and those people will be displaced. Um, and their cultural significance to land will be taken away. So we are fighting very strongly to not have that project go through, and that is just one of thousands that are being in the works right now. My name is Paul Wilson. I'm from the Klamath and Modoc tribes in the United States. I'm representing indigenous communities uh, from the global north and south that do not want to bear the brunt of these false climate solutions. We cannot afford to bear the brunt of these false climate solutions. Climate trading, the carbon offset market are just arms of a new genocide that continue to impact us disproportionately. Indigenous communities represent over 80% of the biodiversity left in this world, and yet you do not see us here in meaningful spaces making decisions. We need to be heard, indigenous rights need to be respected, UNDRIP needs to be respected, and the countless nation and nation relationships that are continuing to be violated need to be reconciled. My name is Weston Boyles, and I am the founder and director of Rios to Rivers. We work to inspire and empower the next generation of river stewards 
and we work with underserved and indigenous uh, students from ages 14 to 19. We became engaged in the top uh, when we understood that the United Nations still recognizes dams as clean energy. So countries can still meet their NDCs or nationally determined contributions towards reducing emissions by uh, building more hydropower in their countries. And through the work that we've done, we've realized uh, that the amount of impacts that uh, dams have to indigenous communities um, and the amount of impact that the dams have to the climate just doesn't make sense. Why are we recognizing dams as clean energy moving forward um, in, this, in this path when actually that might actually be shooting ourselves in the foot? We may be producing a lot of impact. Uh, by um, lifting up these people's voices, um, we've been working together here all week uh, with Weston, Paul, Roberta, Tilo, Conrad, Fiona, um, who else am I forgetting? Fernanda, Paula, um, and Heike. Um, and um, it's been an amazing experience to see these river warriors coming all the way to Glasgow, Scotland um, to give us a, a sane policy uh, to protect our rivers. We know the rivers are lifeblood of our communities. We know they protect biodiversity. And we know that they're a false solution to climate change. So I look forward to discussing this issue with uh, Casey and John tonight. Uh, until then, uh, we may have a little surprise for you. Um, hopefully, we'll be able to discuss that as well. Uh, adios from uh, the Action Zone at COP26. So there we have uh, a bit of John, of Chris's day from from yesterday. We covered some of this yesterday, but we wanted it. We wanted to capture some of those uh, the words from those uh, wonderful team members of him. Uh, Chris, how did it feel for you? Uh, is your team still in town? Uh, they came a long way. Did they feel gratified, or or what was their what were their impressions uh, joining you here at, at uh, COP? Um. I was able to ask a few of them that question. I think this is a meaningful experience and it is empowering uh, to be on the inside of the COP and um, to uh, be working with global advocates and um, and try, I mean, we're all trying to get our voice out there. And um, to a certain extent, um, the COP is like, a, a the bureaucracy of the cop is like a dam standing in our way. Um, and uh, so it is hard to really access the, um, the halls of power here, but um, it's a step in, in the right direction. I, I wouldn't wanna just be uh, like some of the um, really uh, dedicated people that are just standing outside the cop with signs that say, do, you know, do your job. Uh, every single day, um, those drums and everything that you hear, there's always a contingent out there that doesn't have access to come in. Um, so um, I'm glad that we were able to provide this experience to um, bring people inside and to have them uh, get a chance to have some conversations. But um, none of us really, uh, you know, we're not in the room with the decision makers. Um, we talked about this on a previous broadcast. There's also not much communication uh, between the inside and the outside. That, that communication is kind of coming from us, uh, the, uh, the folks that can walk between those two worlds. Um, but um, I, I have to think there's a little bit better way. As um, in the video that you played, the scenes that were in the white room with the backdrop was, um, uh, the presentation actually of this um, 
uh, of this declaration um, to uh, end climate uh, financing for hydropower dam construction. Uh, and so uh, Fiona and, um, uh, and Fernanda uh, and their, their pieces were uh, spoken directly to a UN official. Uh, and that was a very special moment. We had almost our entire uh, coalition there. I think we had one person that had to leave early, um, but that was the day. Uh, and you know, it took um, it took me 24 hours to get that set up to get someone to come outside of the security zone. We were not even allowed to take pictures uh, to receive that declaration from us. And um, and then it, it took another 24 or 48 hours for me just to find the right portal to get it submitted. Um, and it turns out there were these two NGO gatekeepers uh, for uh, um, uh, statements and declarations. Um, we did another request though today, uh, you know, since that video was recorded, um, there's evidently uh, one remaining plenary session where they're going to announce the uh, submissions um, from the observer organizations. And it's possible we could get a chance to um, uh, speak for two minutes before the, uh, the plenary, before the, um, uh, the main group of the COP. Um, so I'm not um, holding out all hope that uh, we will be given that opportunity, but uh, we've requested it um, because we're very serious. So it was, a, it was a great experience. It was empowering, but um, uh, just the bureaucracy that you have to navigate to even make that uh, connection. Um, John and I were talking about it this afternoon. I got to see uh, John Capice inside the cop. That's not, a, that, that's not a Zoom background. He's actually there. <laughs> um, but we were talking about the, uh, the just the calendar and the list of sessions that it's just ridiculous that it's not searchable by keywords. You have to scan every single day and scroll and scroll and scroll and try and glean what it's about by the title. They are, sometimes they have obscure titles, but if you could just search hydropower or search droughts or search resilience or something like that, you could actually plan out a whole um, itinerary for yourself throughout the whole COP and make sure that you are on a track to give you, you know, all the sessions that are most relevant and where the policy dis uh, discussions are happening around that issue. Um, the titles for the policy sessions are just very obscure. It's like the parties will debate, you know, section 10.4.2C on this day. And if you don't already know what that means, you, you know, you're not going to try and go to that session. So, um, so I, th I think they have work to do. And I, I can only imagine what this is like for uh, someone where English is not their first language or, or they're not used to uh, navigating such um, crazy uh, bureaucracies. So um, I think the, the COP itself has a lot of homework to do to make it more accessible, both to uh, you know, the delegates, the observers, as well as the folks outside. John, yeah, John, uh, John actually brought that up because he's been doing, you know, he's been going from pavilion to pavilion and trying to make sense of the of the various, uh, you know, spreadsheets of meetings, and he's he's been tearing his hair out. So, uh, yeah, we've had a couple of discussions about that, and uh, and we'll get into that on Friday. I think we want to have kind of a, a wholesale discussion of the the process here at COP and and the uh, the positives and the negatives and what was accomplished and where they should all short. We'll try to do a resume on Friday. Um, John, you are still there. You have, uh, you have some, uh, Chris joked that you, you appear to be in the Coca-Cola pavilion. Uh, <laughs> with the, with Actually, the polar this bears. is uh, the uh, Tuvalu pavilion. And Tuvalu is a small uh, Pacific Island nation. And I, I noticed it the other day when I was doing, uh, running the numbers on GDP. And at the very bottom of the list of nations uh, ranked by GDP was Tuvalu with a whopping $38 million per year GDP. So a very small nation, very small economy, but basically the poster child for the disappearance of an entire nation as a result of climate change induced sea level rise. So they so tell, us where tu tell, us, tell us where Tuvalu is, John. It's where did uh, between uh, 
I think Guam and uh, Hawaii. Okay. Is what I think it said. Small but, uh, very, very small uh, set of islands. Um, actually, no, I think it's further south. It is. Um, it was a staging ground for the Tarawa uh, invasion during World War II. So the, the Japanese had withdrawn from those islands. The U.S. occupied them without uh, a fight and used it as a staging area for the Tarawa uh, campaign. So a uh, very small area, very small population, but uh, a very respectable and attention-getting pavilion here in Glasgow. Uh, you, you talked about how young people were complaining and uh, about not being permitted in the room with the decision makers. And I'm not, that, that's a valid uh, criticism, but I'm not entirely sure that the decision makers are in the room with the decision makers because it, it is very clear that once the nations send their delegations here, their positions are already well established, what they're going to agree to, what their bottom lines are. The decision makers are back in the respective nations. Whatever group of individuals is determining the leadership and the policies within the respective nations, that's where the decisions on climate are made. They can, uh, uh, the activities at the COP gatherings can influence the folks back in the, in the nations who choose their leaders, but I'm not entirely sure that an awful lot actually happens here at these negotiations. So if we had as many activists back in the USA engaged in the political process, I think we could achieve greater results. Now, the, the problem is, it, it seems to me that the electorate is determining in the United States what our positions are. I mean, we, we had an election in 2016 that sent an administration uh, to Washington that basically stated we are out of the COP process. So uh, that's where the decisions are made in these elections. So activists who want to have an impact in, in Glasgow, in Paris, in I think Egypt next year, need to very much engage the electoral process back home. Um, so the transformation in the United States was evident in, in today's sessions. My, my first stop was at the US Center. Michael, do you have some photos there for us? There we go. So today's theme was transportation. And that was actually the uh, sort of the dominant theme in my day. As I took the bus to get to the COP, uh, the protests caused the rerouting of the uh, buses that would get us from where we were staying to where the conference is being held. So it eventually deposited me in front of the main train station downtown where there was a large gathering of police uh, who appeared to be uh, simply milling around in the case of any eventuality in any location in the city. I think they were ready. They were controlling the central transport location and then being ready to deploy to wherever they might have issues. And uh, next slide, please. And you can see here the, uh, the facade of the central train station. So it's very beautiful structure, a very nice interior, enjoyed uh, uh, navigating that train uh, station this morning. Next slide, please. So when I arrived at the conference, I went to the US Center and the political change in the United States was very evident. This, this session focused on uh, decarbonizing transportation not only in the USA, but in emerging economies. And even though the, the theme was related to emerging economies, the US EPA administrator, Michael Regan, so the head of the US Environmental Protection Agency, was there speaking about trans transformations in the US transport system, as well as what we could do to work with other nations developing economies to help them along the same path. Not that we hadn't diverged from that path ourselves in recent years. So he talked about vehicle standards and he explained how traditionally uh, vehicle standards throughout the world evolved starting in California. California would set standards 
then eventually the United States would adopt the state standards as a national standard. And then the Europeans would combine that standard with their own. And then once the Europeans had decided upon a standard, the rest of the world basically followed suit. He, he emphasized that the Biden administration would be focusing on 2027 rulemaking and trying to ratchet down the emissions from vehicles. And then by 2030, the 2030 rulemaking, they said they would impose much more stringent standards. One program he emphasized was the electrification of school buses. And he said to get that program started, the US government was prepared to uh, fund the deployment of electric buses to uh, free to underserved communities throughout the nation and to the tribal nations. Then, uh, slide please. Yes, here he is, Michael Regan, and he was very enthusiastic and he attracted quite the crowd. Slide. It was a packed house, relatively speaking, and then many more people uh, behind, outside in the corridor, uh, very much attracted by this, this session. Now you'll notice a, a little emblem there. Um, you've got the uh, USAID emblem and then the blue NREL, that's the US Department of Energy National um, Research uh, Laboratory, Renewable Energy Laboratory. And that's a very big facility. So they had representatives at this uh, session as well, slide. Then after the EPA administrator, a, a woman who is in charge of programs at USAID spoke. And USAID is traditionally focused on food and development assistance to various nations throughout the world. But she explained that a top priority for USAID is going to be the transformation of, of the uh, transportation infrastructure in developing nations. So they are developing an entirely new program to assist developing nations adopt electrification programs. Now she explained that uh, in, in developing nations, it's not so much the automobiles. Automobiles are critical, of course, but in, in, in these other countries, it's motorcycles and three wheel vehicles. And she said there's some special challenges to achieving this transformation in developing countries. And first is that their economies are such that they must purchase lower cost vehicles. So the uh, production systems must be more highly developed and evolved, achieving economies of scale before the developing nations will likely be purchasing these vehicles. Secondly, if you're going to have electric vehicles, you need an electric infrastructure within the nation. And this is typically weak in many of these countries. So this, the electrification of transport has to be accompanied by the, uh, renewable electric uh, power generation and distribution. And then thirdly, the lack of financing. Of course, USAID is a primary financing mechanism for prog programs in uh, other nations. Slide, please. And here she is. Uh, next slide, please. And the <clears throat> fellow who seemed to be pulling a lot of strings from behind the scenes was a uh, consultant with a particular NGO that's been involved in the transport sector for many years. So there are a number of partnerships being developed to help implement this new program. And of course, if politics shift again in the United States, all of these newly developed programs could evaporate in a matter of a couple of years. And in fact, um, that reminded me when there was a discussion of some of the uh, biogas issues, and I'll, I'll get to that uh, further on, that even going back as far as the 1980s, the U.S. has had dramatic pendulum swings in its energy policies. So, uh, slide please. I went over to the uh, water pavilion and then the Turkish pavilion, and this slide is from the Turkish pavilion, where they're talking about animal agriculture again and the critical issues of uh, methane and nitrous oxide. Slide, please. And the, the Turkish uh, pavilion seems to have a large number of university people speaking. Every time I've been to the Turkish pavilion and listened in on one of their presentations, it was being delivered by a university professor. So the uh, administration in that nation seems to 
be integrating higher education extensively into their climate change programs. Slide, please. Then I went over to a, uh, an interesting pavilion, a technology collaboration program. And they were talking about carbon capture and storage. And that's a, a, a process of, of sequestering carbon in concentrated forms. So slide, please. Basically, it's a, a matter of capturing the carbon dioxide, whether that's derived from fossil fuel combustion or perhaps leakage from uh, natural gas processing, or in fact, uh, air capture, direct air capture of carbon dioxide. And then that carbon dioxide has to be processed into a concentrated form, has to be transported, and then injected into stable ge geologic formations. Slide. So the sites where they've been testing out the, this concept of cab carbon capture and storage are primarily in North America, the United States and Canada, uh, Europe, primarily Northern Europe, and then Middle East, China, Japan, and some in Australia and New Zealand. Slide. Countries can integrate carbon capture and storage into their overall climate program uh, following from the Paris Agreement. Uh, within the Paris Agreement, 43 nations submitted programs in uh, CCS as part of their commitments. Slide. In the United States, this, this CCS program is being led by the University of Texas at Austin. And I worked with them back in 2006 when we were considering some uh, carbon capture and storage programs in Florida. Slide. They have about 25 years of experience in the United States on this subject. So they are leading the effort in working with developing nations that may want to pursue some of these projects. Slide. Now the funding for this is coming from the Green Action Fund. And the Green Action Fund is that pool of money that's being committed to assist developing nations achieve some of the climate change goals. And Chris has been focusing on this in an attempt to make sure that this green climate fund is not used for the hydroelectric projects. Slide. Now the sources of the carbon dioxide come from a few sort of in, in transient uh, uh, programs or sources of carbon in the nation. Cement industry is being cited as a primary CO2 generator, power industry, oil and gas industry, as well as transport. So CCS is only looking at sectors where transforming them to renewable energies is unlikely or impractical in the current conditions. Slide. A professor or PhD from Nigeria uh, describe their programs since they have a huge oil and gas production industry in their nation. They are seeing it as being unlikely that they will eliminate those anytime soon. So CCS is an option for them. The Nigerian presenter also introduced the Minister of Environment from the nation of Nigeria. So Nigeria was well represented at this session. Slide. We'll, we'll skip this slide, thank you. Then there was an example from the Caribbean and the Caribbean was talking about how they bring in uh, liquefied natural gas and there's a lot of leakage and capture and some issues associated with that. And they were looking at carbon capture and sequestration relative to a lot of the expired or depleted oil and gas reservoir formations. So that's a sort of a special case and uh, probably limited quantities in that particular example. But Nigeria, much larger case, major oil producer. Slide. Then I went at the end of the day to the cryosphere for sort of a reality check. And that's always um, disappointing when you hear the, the uh, Arctic and Antarctic scientists speak, 
because they always invariably return to the uh, paleoclimate record. Slide, please. And what, what this perspective gives us is an indication of what the long-term implications of our current actions are like. This was a graphic demonstrating the speaker's experience with CO2 levels. She cited how her grandmother was born in 1898 when CO2 levels were at 295 and how today they're at 417. So just a couple of generations, we have dramatically increased the CO2 content of our atmosphere. Slide. Their main point was citing two examples, the paleocene ecocene thermal maximum, when CO2 concentrations were elevated upwards of 1,000 to 1,500 parts per million in a relatively short period of time over perhaps 1,000 years or so. And we are currently on track 500, and uh, so it's not direct example, but it, it the point that they're trying to make is that you can elevate the CO2 level in the atmosphere, but the system takes a very long time to respond and reach its equilibrium point. So even though you may elevate your CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere and then decrease them, the system may still respond as if you had elevated them for a much longer period of time. So in response to the 1500 to 1000 part per million, the CO, the temperatures, the global temperatures increase by approximately eight degrees Celsius. So uh, whereas we're not on track for a thousand, we are clearly on track for 500, perhaps 600, and therefore could see a very significant temperature increase that would play out over thousands of years. The second example they provided was the last interglacial period about 125,000 years ago, but that was a solar forcing. In other words, changes in the amount of solar radiation were the, were, was the driving factor for that transformation. So it was a very interesting day, uh, focused on transportation, but including many other discussions at the various points. AC. Kind of head spinning to, to see all this going on and to try to make sense of it and, and try to, you know, pare away uh, the, the, you know, the details and try to get some kind of understanding of uh, the prospects for, for tackling these issues and getting a hold of it. Um, it's a good, good uh, tour again, John. Uh, we learned a lot of stuff. Um, Chris, do you have any comments on, on what John has shared with us? Sure. Um, yeah, it was a, uh, Intrigued by what you had to say about the carbon capture and storage, um, because uh, we part partnered with a coalition that came out against that earlier this year, um, and so I would like to learn more about it. But uh, essentially, the um, the as we understand it, that um, the technology right now uh, does not work at scale. Uh, it doesn't work at the um, anywhere near the diversity of uh, you know, carbon emissions, where, where they come from geographically. And uh, it's kind of being touted as a gee whiz um, thing that the, um, you know, uh, that the industries are courting the government uh, for in order to allow them to keep emitting now um, while they ramp up this new technology that's going to save us later. And we're still on track for 2050 net zero because we've got this new new toy um, and it's called uh, carbon capture and storage. And it's also uh, factors into uh, uh, plastics manufacturing and things like that. So, and, and then there's also the, the concept of additionality. Uh, are they using um, carbon capture around the edges while we still are burning fossil fuels in the foreground? Um, did, they, did they talk any, but anything at all about challenges of scale or financing or economics around this, or is this all sort of white lab coat stuff still? Well, I sort of bailed out of the session uh back to go meet with you uh, uh, before <laughs> the end. But it's, it's been my observation, 
when I look at the numbers associated with this, it, it becomes largely Im impractical on an energetic level because you know we're getting diminishing returns on the fossil fuels that we extract. It takes increasingly uh, greater amounts of energy to extract a barrel of oil from the ground or natural gas. And then, then you're imposing a whole nother thermodynamic cycle and industrial cycle at the tail end of that to capture the CO2, to find the CO2, to transport the CO2, to re-inject the CO2. So again, you're diminishing the energy return off of those fossil fuels. So at a certain point, the numbers just don't work out. And I agree with you that it's likely only a subsidized option for the continuation of fossil fuel industries in nations that are unlikely to make the, the, the switch over. And Nigeria might be one such example, a country of 200 million people sort of on the edge of economic survival with their primary export being fossil fuels. So for them to end that revenue stream immediately or in their eyes ever, may be impractical and uh, one way for them to perhaps reinvest some of their profits from that or to attempt to extract foreign aid from other nations to subsidize their oil and gas industry. They may be pursuing carbon capture and storage. Yeah, I, I, I find that a kind of a slippery slope. I mean, we were approached, you know, we have a, an abundance of blue-green algae in South Florida where I am. And, and I, we're approached from time to time by people that want to create products out of blue-green algae. I mean, I, somebody is actually making a shoe, a running shoe out of blue-green algae. And, and my concern is always, well, you know, once they have that production line up and running, what happens if they, if they run out of resources? So it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of a co-op thing. You know, the, those, the people who are engaged in that, in that industrial or commercial activity are going to want more and more of the product, then we should be curing this on the front end instead of trying to trying to correct it on the back end. I'm not even sure it's practical. Uh, the uh, the carbon carbon capture. I mean, it's an intriguing idea, uh, but it's it's uh, as as we said, it may be uh, it may be uh, just a, a giving permission to the fossil fuel companies to uh, keep keep doing what they do. Uh, but we're we're kind of out of time. We're we're very close to the end of this show. Uh, any, you, you have a final thought, John, you want to share with us? Well, I'm wondering what we can accomplish in the last two days. Uh, you know, we've, we've been here in effect 10 days and yeah. uh, uh, haven't accomplished nearly as much as we hoped to as far as extracting information from all of these wonderful pavilions and uh, sessions. So uh, Rush is going to be on to, to make the most of these last two days. Yeah, we've got two two more shows to deliver, and I, I would kind of like to have, to have the last show serve as a kind of a, a brainstorming session to see what 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 we've taken away, and, and if we can kind of uh, kind of establish or understand any any uh, large shifts that might have happened, and what we think uh, you know are, are possible solutions uh, that that we might have uh, might have derived from the from the thirteen days of the COP, but. Um, but we don't we don't have time to get into all that tonight. So uh, we're we're going to wind down. Thank you very much, uh, Chris. Uh, congratulations on delivering that proclamation. That was a really cool thing. And uh, John, as always, your input is insightful and uh, and uh, and meaningful. So uh, thank you very much, folks. And thanks to everybody for tuning in. We will be with you tomorrow. Thank you. Thanks.